In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So please listen to these beautiful words about the ideal Christian community, which St. Paul describes in the epistle of today. It is a community of saints adorned with every Christian virtue. In this community, love is queen. In her train follows the peace of Christ. This is how the early Christians lived. With them, the word of God dwelt abundantly. We hear them singing psalms and spiritual canticles, and privately, their every act is performed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's study some of that. With the early Christians, love is queen. Uh, that's a very easy to be understood uh, phrase, love is queen. But let's take it back to what St. Paul he says. He says that um, charity is the bond of perfection, meaning that you and I have the state of grace because of our baptism and then all the sacraments which have followed that. And this state of grace is nothing but the love that exists between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. And so that is shared with us, or we become part of that love, and that becomes the bond of perfection. So uh, we have people we deal with, with whom we're friends, and that's magnificent. We have to remember that what keeps us all together is that we're part of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're part of the Blessed Trinity. But then we'll have times where we're dealing with people who are not such friends of ours, of ours, and we're not so, so much friends of theirs either. But somehow we still have to deal with them. And that could be in church, that could be in the family, that could be at work, that could be with neighbors. We have to remember that charity is the bond of perfection. We belong to the Blessed Trinity. And so this union or this love that passes between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity must also pass between us and others. That's why St. Paul says it's the bond of perfection. So when I tell you that love is queen, I don't mean it in any kind of sentimental, superficial, commercial sense. I mean it in the sense of we are incorporated into the Blessed Trinity. And that's how it was for the early Christians as well. And the peace of Christ follows in her train, in the train of charity. Well, what's that all about? Uh, if uh, we are receiving the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by going to confession, by going to communion, by participating, be present, being present at Mass, assisting at Mass. If we're reading, if we're uh, praying regularly, and not just memorize prayers, which we all certainly need, morning and night prayers, rosary, blessing the meals, uh, but also mental prayer, keeping ourselves in contact with God by spontaneous conversation with Him. Hopefully we can do that in the mornings already for about 15 minutes. That would be magnificent. Spontaneous conversation between my soul and God, and God and my soul, every day for 15 minutes, and then throughout the day when we carry out our duties. Just a little aspiration in the direction of God. I love you. Thank you for saving my soul or sanctifying my soul, etc. I need your help. Please help this other person. Just maintaining that spirit of prayer. Uh, that is what gives so much grace to the rest of our day. And by doing that, we maintain the state of grace in our soul and we maintain peace of Christ. The peace of Christ follows in her train. The peace of Christ follows in the train of this charity, which is the love of the three blessed persons of the Blessed Trinity shared with us. So, let's study a little bit how we are compared to the people back in the day when St. Paul was writing this epistle. Well, we're somewhat like they are. However, I would say that our, mo our modern life doesn't revolve around the Christian community as much as it used to back then. When we say that we must make love be the queen of our life, we mean that it should be the criteria or the, the foundation of all of our actions. Uh, St. Augustine is famous for having a life which was uh, the life of a non-churched man. St. Augustine was known for 
uh, knowing about the Christian religion, knowing about our Lord Jesus Christ, not, but not becoming a Christian. And the reason he wouldn't become a Christian is because he saw that uh, as soon as you do become a Christian, then you have to make all kinds of renunciations of yourself, particularly the, the immoral life. And he didn't, want, he didn't think he could make that step. So he just wouldn't and wouldn't and wouldn't do it until uh, one day it finally struck him that if one could be completely dedicated to desiring God, if one could be completely given to loving God, by that very love for God, he would renounce all kinds of other loves. And that's what St. Augustine did. He put on our Lord Jesus Christ and renounced everything else that he, that he apparently loved. And he completely dedicated himself towards loving God, and that's what made his whole life moral, and that's what made him into a Christian as well. So in this sense, love is queen, and the virtuous life normally, uh, naturally follows it. The early Christians had the word of God dwelling among them abundant, abundantly. They didn't quite have a Bible yet. That didn't come out until at least 300 years after Christ. But they had the word of God dwelling in them in that their preachers, their bishops, were giving them the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were giving them the epistles of St. Paul. They were giving them the Acts of the Apostles. And these people were, the, the Holy Ghost was converting them. The Holy Ghost was forming the image of Christ in them through the words of the Bible that were actualized in them. And this uh, love of the um, Holy Scriptures, the love of the Gospels, etc., is what caused them to uh, break out in song at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and in spiritual gatherings. These hymns and these canticles were a proof of their union of heart with God. So I'd like to take just a little bit of a break here and, and insert that... Uh, We've been going for one year or two years now easily uh, without any singing in our church because some sort of rules from without and we don't know when it will stop. But the point is that when one is worshiping God, when one is in the state of grace, when one is receiving grace, he naturally wants to sing. That's the language of heaven. And someday hopefully we, we, we will sing in heaven. But it's unfortunate that right now we can't have any singing because that is the normal breaking out of the joy of the soul, of the soul that's completely dedicated to the love of God. And speaking of the early Christians again, their every act was performed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, that one is challenging. I've already told you about uh, how our whole day long, our life has to be a prayer. And that's how we begin to perform everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But besides that, there has to be a lot of renunciation of self. We're all, we're all tempted to say angry words. We're tempted to have angry thoughts. We like to seek our own glory. We like, sometimes we crush other people when we, when we think they have too much glory. We uh, tend to be idle sometimes, and that lets the devil get into our thoughts and our works. We have vain thoughts, and kind of useless things that have nothing to do with um, uh, producing the reality. We have envious thoughts, we, and we do not rejoice in the glory of others. Why are we like this? And the answer is, these things are naturally against us because we have an evil tendency, which is called concupiscence. And we have that since we were born with our original sin. That concupiscence, sorry, that uh, original sin has been taken away, no problem, but the concupiscence remains. That's, say, the tendency towards evil. And there's a reason that God leaves that attached to our soul or in, uh, in, as part of our soul. And uh, to explain that, I have to jump from the epistle now to the gospel which is this uh, parable of our Lord, kind of a mystery, uh, where the master of the house goes out to sow good seed. He's sowing wheat, or he's planting wheat. And that night his enemy comes and sows weeds. 
cockle, bad herbs in the, um, in the field. And they start to grow up together. The servants notice it and they say, let's take away the, the weeds. And the master says, no, we can't do that. If you do that, the, um, the weeds will tear up the good plant also. Better that they both grow up together. And when it's all mature, you can separate them and throw the weeds away, or let them burn, and the wheat can be gathered into the barn. So it's a beautiful ideal. And how can we apply that to what I'm saying? So far, I've told you what we have in the epistle, that we have to have the charity, the bond of perfection. We have to have love as queen. We have to have the, the peace of Christ, the harmony that's in the soul. This will make us um, know the word of God and live abundantly by the word of God, and that will make us break out, break out in spiritual song. Beautiful. But we also know that the reality is that none of us grows up so purely, and purely in the sense of, just the gospel, just the church, just the religious life. We know that God allows to be mixed in our soul a whole bunch of worldly principles. And God allows for our concupiscence, our tendency towards sin, to remain in our soul. And that might get a little frustrating to us. We want to love God. We live in his grace. We're a kind of a reproduction of him in that we're baptized. And yet, wicked things pass through our minds, or at least mediocre things, uh, things that are not virtuous, pass through our mind. And sometimes we actually carry them out. Uh, that is cockle, or the weeds, growing up with the wheat. But God, in particular, our Lord Jesus Christ, does not allow this to happen by accident. If he wanted to, he could remove all the wickedness from our heart. And all of my selfishness, all my anger, all my vain thoughts, he could remove like that. But the question is, if he did that, what kind of a um, trophy or what kind of a victory would I have to offer him when it came to my particular judgment? I would just be saying, well, here's the, you know, the ticket that you bought from me. I'm giving it back to you now, so um, I hope you receive glory from this. That would be a nothing. That would be a nothing. Our Lord wants the weeds to grow up with the wheat so that the wheat, sorry, this is kind of a personification of material things, so that the wheat can become strong and fight against the weeds and become greater and present a greater victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it lets the two things grow up together. Not just hear the church against the world or hear the church against all the secular people that are out there. That's a very important part of this parable. But Please try to see this part of it also. We have wheat and cockle in our own soul. And our Lord wants for this wheat in our soul to win against the cockle. And that will make the wheat more saintly. That will make the wheat more vigorous. Uh, that will give the wheat a greater victory. So today in the Holy Mass, you may notice if you follow your missal and all the proper prayers, that the secret of today's Mass ask, makes this request. May this sacrifice of propitiation, that would be the Holy Mass, steady our vacillating hearts. Vacillating hearts would be the will inside of our soul that one day wants to serve God and the next day wants to serve this world. One day wants to serve God and the next day wants to serve itself. That's a vacillating heart. But we're praying in the secret of today's Mass, may the sacrifice of propitiation heal us of that tendency. Keep us uh, tending towards God. Keep us directed towards God. With all the sacrifices that are necessary, all the renunciation of self that is necessary in order to stay connected to God. And in the post-communion of today's Mass, we hear the words that the Holy Eucharist is the pledge of salvation's fulfillment. Meaning, if we continue to receive Holy Communion in, uh, you know, in the state of grace and worthily and with the right sentiments, if we continue to receive the Holy Eucharist well, this will be the guarantee that all of our work for sanctification will have its fulfillment in being saved. That's wheat versus cockle. That's wheat getting the strength over all the evil tendencies in our soul. 
In the light of the gospel parable of today, this means that the divine reaper, our Lord Jesus Christ, is already gathering our ripened sheaves into his heavenly barns. That's magnificent. You might think that we have to wait till after this life to see those who are good rewarded. That's when he's going to gather the sheaves into his barn. But in fact, already in this life, if we're letting the wheat of our soul conquer the cockle of our soul, we are getting the reward of more grace and more merit to become more saintly. In this way, the, um, the wheat is already, be, already being gathered into the barn. So we ask our Blessed Mother very much to help us with this because it's all about renunciation of self, you know? Not my selfishness, not my anger, not my pride, not my envy, not everything. That's the um, charter of the sanctification of our Blessed Mother. Not me, not me, not me, not me. And the more she renounced herself, the more God filled her with his own kingdom. And you know, if we do that, that will make the wheat conquer over the cockle. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.